Welcome for worship to, uh, for Sunday, December 6th, the second Sunday of Advent. And uh, our organist, Jeff Burke, and soloist, Diane Hiddleston, have already done the music, and I'm here alone with Jackie Hull, our media specialist. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and our call to worship is taken from Psalm 85, verses 7 through 9. Just a few verses. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in the land. May God add a blessing to this reading from the Holy Word. At this point, I will have Diane sing for us our opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 211. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. 
And now Jackie Hall will lead us in the lighting of the Advent wreath and our Advent prayer. God, who brought light from darkness, help us to see your light so well that it not only illumines our path, but reflects off us to illumine others. We pray this prayer in the name of the one who was called the light of the world. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice, of one calling in, a voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lift, raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all humankind together will see it for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I, asked, and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up to a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Here ends the reading from the prophet Isaiah. At this point, Diane will sing for us the Advent hymn, Blessed Be the God of Israel, number 209. Thank you. with songs that never 
epistle lesson is taken from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Peter wrote, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's a very important sentence, that God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter continues, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be dis destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in its heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him at peace with God. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Here ends the reading from Second Peter. May God add a blessing to it. Of all the prophets in the Bible, I'd like to say that, I'd, I'd have to say that Isaiah is my favorite, even though Jesus seemed to give John the Baptist top billing by saying at one point, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there are, has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. But then Jesus added, yet he who is least in the kingdom of, of heaven is greater than he. Still, it was Isaiah who prophesied about John the Baptist, Baptist coming to announce the beginning of Jesus Christ's public ministry in today's passage from Isaiah chapter 40. First, Isaiah declared God's desire and intention to comfort his people, the nation of Israel, after they had endured a period of divine punishment for their sins, perhaps in a time of exile. Next, Isaiah spoke of a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Now all four Gospels agree that John the Baptist was the one who fulfilled that prophecy of Isaiah because he was the last prophet before Jesus, the Son of God, arrived on earth, and indeed he baptized Jesus. The word picture that Isaiah painted in his prophetic book was one of an ancient Near Eastern country getting ready for a royal visit by preparing a highway for the procession of a king. That king would be Jesus, but it was the hearts of people that John the Baptist actually prepared for Christ's comings, not the roads. John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which prepared the way for Jesus, the Messiah, to come and preach a very similar message, but he also baptized with the Holy Spirit. The scripture readings for Advent always include references to John the Baptist, because we are to prepare our hearts for the celebration of Christ's first coming at Christmas by repenting of our sins and asking for God's grace and forgiveness but we are also to get and be prepared for Christ's second coming in glory and power by doing the same. In Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah also prophesied and promised that the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
Now we know that prophecy will be completely fulfilled when Jesus comes again in glory on the judgment day. Matthew's gospel records what Jesus said about that time, and I quote, At that time, the, son of man, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man, and remember that's how Jesus referred to himself, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Our epistle lesson from 2 Peter also talks about that time when Christ returns as the day of our Lord, the time when the earth will be judged and destroyed by God before he brings in a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness rather than the home of evil and sin and injustice, which too often prevail now upon this earth. The author of Psalm 8, from which I read a few verses as our call to worship, also envisioned a time when faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven, a time and a place where love and faithfulness meet together and righteousness and peace kiss each other. That's a sort of a bizarre image, but friends, the new heavens and the new earth will be such a place of perfect peace and righteousness, a place of perfect love and faithfulness to God and to our fellow human beings. But that was not the world that our Lord Jesus was born into. No, Jesus came into our fallen, sinful world to save us and to redeem us from suffering for all the sins in our lives through the sacrifice of his own life on our behalf. Nevertheless, part of the good news of Christ's birth and his incarnation was also that humanity doesn't have to wait until the very end of time to see God's glory revealed. Because Jesus, God's one and only Son, revealed God's glory when he walked this earth. On that note, John chapter 1, verse 14 reads, and I quote, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And just to be clear, the, wor the, the, the word in that verse refers to God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, who became a human in the baby Jesus while remaining fully God. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the Bible, called the message, translated that same verse, John chapter 1, verse 14, like this. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw his glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son. Folks, can you imagine if Jesus had moved into your neighborhood where you live? Imagine you had watched him grow up and then as an adult prove that he was the Messiah by his words and his miracles. John's gospel also talked about Jesus as the son of God revealing his glory when, when, and power throughout his ministry. The first example that John gave of Jesus revealing his glory was when Christ changed the water into the wine. I imagine John meant that Jesus revealed his glory, uh, the glory of God as creator, when he performed that miracle, because God the Son shares in God the Father's awesome creative power. Later in John's Gospel, when Jesus' friend Lazarus got sick, Jesus himself remarked, this sickness will not end in death, no, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And indeed, Jesus was glorified through it as God's Son when he raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus had been rotten, already been in the, in the tomb for nine full days, or four full days, excuse me. Lazarus' sister, Martha, 
and all those there at the time saw the glory of God revealed through Jesus Christ, his son, when Jesus ordered Lazarus to come out and Lazarus came out alive. Of course, as I said, Jesus was also glorified as God's son and as the resurrection and the life that he had claimed to be. And you may also know that on the night that before Jesus died on the cross, he prayed to God, his father, saying this, I have brought you glory by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Just think, Jesus left all the glories of heaven to be born into poverty in the first century. That sacrifice alone boggles the mind, even without considering his crucifixion and death for us. But Jesus made that sacrifice so that he could reveal God to us in his words and in his deed and show us the glory of God's amazing love for us. In fact, the anonymous author of Hebrews once wrote, referring to Jesus, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things, by his powerful word, sustaining all things with his po- by his powerful world, word. Friends, let's put that strong statement about Christ's divinity alongside the comment that Jesus made in Mark chapter 14, verse 31, that I meant to, per- to point out in last week's lesson, gospel lesson, but failed to. In Mark 14, verse 31, Jesus said this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Did you hear that last week? Consider who could say that and have it be true. Only God, of course. A deluded lunatic, could, a crazy person could say it, but that wouldn't make it true. But only God could say that and have it be true. And interestingly enough, today's passage from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, clearly states, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Because Jesus was the Son of God, the word of God in the flesh, his his words indeed will stand forever and never pass away because they are the word of they are the words of God himself words that transform and sustain creation words that have the power to tell the winds and the waves to stop words that can heal words that can help words that even have the power to raise the dead to life and make the impossible possible if he so wills it In Isaiah's day, it was good tidings that the sovereign Lord comes with power to rule and to save his people and to tend his flock like a loving shepherd, gathering the lambs in his arms and carrying them close to his heart. Just picture that. It's a wonderful picture of God's compassion and care for us. It is still good news and glad tidings that Jesus came to earth as the good shepherd to lay down his life for the sheep, his people. And it remains somewhat scary, but still good news, that Christ will come again to gather all his faithful people to himself and to recreate the heavens and the earth or to to bring in a totally new heaven and, and new earth, unaffected by the ravages and damages of sin. Nevertheless, It is important to realize that our God and Savior is present and active in our world here and now, every day, working in and through his people by his Holy Spirit and in other ways that we will not fully know or comprehend until that time when we meet God face to face. But know for a fact that God still tries to tend his people as as the Good Shepherd and to call us back when we stray into sin. 
Know for a fact that God still carries us close to his heart, even if we can't see him or, or even feel him. And know for a fact that God still plans to make good on all his promises. Therefore, let us, in grateful obedience, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and, in, and at peace with him, as the Apostle Peter wrote. And friends, we can do that by consistently and sincerely confessing our sins when we realize that we've committed, committed them, and by earnestly asking God for his grace and forgiveness for those sins. And we will receive it by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Thanks be to God. Although God is patient, as Peter wrote, let us not make him wait long for us to repent of our wrongdoing, lest the day of the Lord's coming catch us unawares. Let's do it now and prepare our hearts for Christ and for Christmas. Amen. At this time, I am going to have Diane sing for us the Christmas carol, He is Born, number 228. Let us be in prayer. Gracious God, as we come to you this second sun Sunday of Advent, we pray that you will hear all the unspoken prayers of our hearts, our deepest longings, our most difficult problems, and give us your guidance and your peace. Lord, we pray this day for all those who are sick, whether that's mental or physical, sick with COVID or cancer or any other illness or whether chronic or, or, or sudden, whether we're struggling with injuries or old age, Lord, we pray for your help and your healing. Lord, we also pray that you would be with those who are hungry and homeless, who are unemployed, those who are unemployed and underemployed, those who are underpaid and, and struggling financially. We pray also, Lord, for all those people who are struggling with their faith in you because of all the challenges in their lives. 
We pray that you might lead them into a deeper knowledge and love of you. And for those who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we pray that they might come to do so. We also pray for those relationships that are troubled in these times, whether we are thinking of a marriage or family or friendship that is strained. And we pray for your direction and your forgiveness and grace to work in and through us to others. Lord, we pray for all those who are lonely and anxious and afraid and, those, and, and all those who need your comfort for they are grieving, whether it's the loss of loved ones recently or, or long ago or somewhere in between. Comfort them, Lord, by, with your peace and your presence and help them to know the assurance of your care for their loved ones. We also pray for our government leaders to make the right decisions to fight COVID and to ensure a safe and orderly transition of power in this nation and the preservation of our democracy. We also pray for all the world's leaders and decision makers as they, as they face the challenges of COVID and, other, uh, and the accompanying economic distress as well as political unrest. Give them your guidance and your wisdom, we pray. We also pray, of course, for our healthcare workers and first responders and essential workers and all who face the, the who, who work to help in these, in these difficult times. We pray for protection for all those who serve, and we pray for ourselves as well. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and give you thanks and praise for being a gracious and good and generous and wise God. We pray now in the words which Jesus taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank all of you who very much who have been either sending uh, your offerings into the church or or in the mail, or dropping them through the mail slot in front of the church, and, and, I, and I want to uh, thank you for the support of the ministry of this church, as well as the general ministry of the United Methodist Church by your tithes and offerings. And during Advent, for the last several years, you re may remember that I've been using a couple verses of What Child Is This as our offertory anthem. And so I'm now going to ask Diane to sing verses 1 and 3, of what child is this, number 219. <laughs> Shut 
And using the words of the Apostle Paul from the end of 2 Corinthians, may you receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our closing hymn is, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, that Diane will sing uh, verses 1 and 4 of number 218. And may you have a blessed week. Amen. Mm -hmm.